Hi, this is Steve at Blessed Hope Forever. I'd like to talk about John chapter 21. Uh, it's a familiar passage to many Christians. If you love me, feed my sheep. The Lord, of course, has risen from the dead, and he's made several appearances to his disciples and to others who've worshipped him and followed him, verifying his physical, literal resurrection from the dead establishing the certainty of his deity. Uh, here he's met with seven of his disciples at the Sea of Galilee, and they had uh, fished all night, catching nothing, kind of like, you know, when I go. Even though they're accomplished fishermen, and they, they should know what they're doing, uh, they caught nothing. And there's Jesus on the shore, uh, as they're coming in after a hard night's work and he tells them where to drop the net and they catch a great number of fish 153 you all know the story and he feeds them with one small fish and one little biscuit there were uh, well there's no doubt that they were really hungry must have been hungry working all night and the indication is they were fully satisfied with what he fed them and i think it's foolish to miss the miracle, the fact that once again, the Lord multiplied the food sufficient for their need. And I believe that the lesson is absolutely clear to each one of us that the word of God is sufficient. Uh, and though it appears little and insignificant, it'll grow and grow and grow and it'll continue to satisfy and meet our needs as it's touched by the hand of God. Of the seven preceding miracles in the Gospel of John, it'd be, it'd be foolish, again, I think, in my opinion, to miss their significance in how God has worked in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, having called us out of sin and death. And here it would just be just as foolish, I think, to miss the lesson that we are fed from the hand of the Lord. And it is sufficient, though it may not look that way. After they had dined, this is when he addresses Simon directly, and we come to one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. They obviously had gathered around the fire of coals. I don't think they were spread up and down the beach, and so he fed them. So they're all there. They must have heard what he's saying to Peter. And so he says to Peter, do you love me? The Lord asked Peter if he loved him, and he used a word. He used a different word than Peter's going to use. He used the word, for love, agape. Jesus used the word agape. Peter, he uses the word phileo. That's not clear from the English. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you can't study the word of God if you don't know Greek and Hebrew anymore than I'd tell you that you can't dig a ditch if you don't have a backhoe. It's just a little bit more work, but it is quite clear here in the original language that the Lord said to Peter, do you selflessly love me? Do you love me with a love that is high and noble? and anticipates nothing in return, expects nothing in return. Do you agape me? And Peter's answer was, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. But he used the Greek word phileo, not agape. This is phileo, phileo. You know that I have affection for you, would be our English translation. Phileo means brotherly love, an emotional love, a deep affection, Peter says, I have a deep affection for you. And the Lord's answer was, feed my lambs. The Lord has said that he's going to go to Jerusalem to die. The disciples can't believe that. That's not, that's, that couldn't possibly be why he came. He came to establish a kingdom. He came to be the king of the Jews and to throw off all Roman authority and exalt Israel and the the Jews to a high status in the world. That's, that's why he came. He didn't come to die. And so they had half truths. They could see the promise of a reigning Messiah. They did not see and their eyes were, were closed to the revelation of a suffering Messiah. I read where the Lord has laid on upon him the iniquity of us all. The sin issue has been forever settled, yet their minds were attracted to earthly things, not heavenly. They had all the scriptures, but their eyes were blinded. You know, it just couldn't be that he, that he would die. 
And the Lord said that they were all going to be offended because of it. Obviously, Peter didn't like that at all. We are told that Peter denied the Lord three times, and he den denied the Lord violently three times, and now the Lord asks him three times, do you love me? The Lord said, do you love me more than these? Okay, now ignoring the fact that the word these is masculine in the original, uh, many have said, well, that what he's asking is, is, do you love me more than fishing? And I don't think that that's fits the text or the grammar. Peter says in, in Matthew 26, which wasn't very long ago chronologically, it hasn't been very long ago, that Peter said, uh, though all of these men should forsake you, I never will. You know, I'm more than willing to die for you. So it hasn't been very long that he said that. In fact, it hasn't been very long that he wept bitterly when he realized that he had denied his Lord and the Lord calls him Simon. Simon, the word Peter means rock, a small rock. It actually means a pebble size stone. Peter probably would have, would have uh, liked to have been more named a big rock, a boulder, you know, but it means rock, steadfastness, and he wasn't. He wasn't steadfast, though he boasted that he would not deny, and though he boasted that he would not be offended, and that he he would not desert. He did all of those things. He was offended. He did desert. He did deny him, and he wept bitterly. The Lord calls him Simon. It's my personal opinion. I believe that he calls him Simon here to bring Peter up short to realize that here is my Lord who has renamed me Peter, rock, steadfast, and now he's calling me Simon, son of Jonah. Do you love me more than these, more than these other disciples? Uh, he used a very strong word for love, and Peter said, Lord, you know, and the word know is oida, perfect intellectual knowledge. The language here is, is utterly beautiful. When we go through verses, uh, I think 15 through 17, these three verses, the word oida is intellectual comprehension, intellectual knowledge. It's not experiential knowledge, but intellectual knowledge. You know that I have affection for you. And he used the word phileo. And what, the, what was the answer? Feed my lambs. The word for feed is bosco in the Greek. It's a word that means to provide nourishment for the little ones. And then he said unto him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he left out the more than these. And again, he uses agape, do you love me? And Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know. And again, he uses the word oida. In, bo in both verses, Peter uses it in the perfect tense I don't think that you would be violating the text to suggest that, that we could translate that, Lord, you've always known that I love you, that I have affection for you. And he says the same thing here in the perfect tense. Lord, you've always known that I have affection for you. And now the Lord says, feed my sheep. Feed my little sheep. A different word for sheep. And uh, there seems to be a great graduation here from lambs to little sheep to mature sheep, young sheep, old sheep. The word for feed here means shepherd, means to shepherd, to guard, to provide the pasture, to lead them. It's a word that should be translated shepherd. It's all that a shepherd does. He's the one that leads the flock. He's the one that provides the pasture. He, he leads them to the correct pasture not the wrong pasture, the, the right pasture. He takes the oversight of the flock because he loves the Lord. Jesus says to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, never changed his, his address to Peter. There hasn't, there hasn't been any change in Peter, Simon, son of Jonah. Now, when you read on in your text, Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him a third time. He asked the same question three times, and Peter's grieved that he did that. 
Now, I think it's clear in the English, but it's much, much more clear in the Greek. My Bible says that he was grieved because he said the third time, do you love me? And he uses the word Peter used, phileo, do you really have affection for me? And Peter was grieved. He was made to be grieved. It's a, it's a passive voice in the Greek. He was made sorry. He was made to grieve because the Lord used phileo. Peter, Peter liked the word the Lord was using. I don't know whether you want to ascribe some kind of humility to Peter for that, to, to him for that, that he, that he wouldn't go to that high word agape. That's sort of what I think. Remember just that a few days ago, he had violently denied the Lord. I mean, could he in the presence of that denial say, Lord, you know that I love you with a selfless love, that I would die for you? Could I, when he knows that, that in himself he couldn't get there? I don't know, but I'm absolutely persuaded. Peter loved the fact that the Lord used the word that he did. And now he says, Peter, do you really have affection for me? And Peter said, Lord, you know, poida, perfect intellectual knowledge, you know, all things, all things. And, and you know, gnosko, experiential knowledge, that I have a deep affection for you. You know, intellectually, all things, all things. And there is a great testimony on the part of Peter, the apostle, to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ as God of very God. I have no idea what the percentage might be, but I'm certain that the majority of the so-called Christian community today does not believe that Jesus Christ is God of very God. And yet here we have a tremendous testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. Lord, you know all things. And folks, until we passed that point in our theology, the scriptures mean virtually nothing. The deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is central to all that we call Christian. God Almighty in eternity past decreed to show his wrath against sin and his mercy on vessels of mercy which he had before appointed to glory and in order to show his wrath against sin, there needed to be sin. He placed Adam in the garden to sin. And sin is so evil in the sight of God that God himself had to empty himself and take upon himself the form of a servant, be made in the likeness of men, and die in our place. And I believe Peter recognizes that the Lord is driving home the lesson that in his three denials, these are the things that he had turned his back on. Peter had spent several years with the Lord, as, did, as had the rest of the disciples. It seems to me that in in absolute confidence, Peter seems like he could have watched the trial of Christ and said, ah, aha, this is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. This is God Almighty, my Redeemer, purchasing my eternal redemption and, and could have confidently, peacefully, and even joyfully watched the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, realizing it was what God had decreed before time began. And I'm, I'm reading, Lord, you know all things. And then Peter changed his language. Thou knowest that I love thee. And he still refuses for reasons that I believe to be clear to, to use the word agape. He still uses the word phileo, but he changed the word for no. And, and now he uses gnosko, or he actually used both, both of them. Gnosko, experiential knowledge. I believe the Lord was saying in his switching from agape to phileo, uh, the word Peter can only bring himself to use if all you have is that. Feed and shepherd my sheep. In many of our past studies, I've discussed oida as the word for intellectual knowledge versus the Greek word gnosko, experiential knowledge, Adam knew his wife, that's the word gnosko, and she conceived. Peter is saying here that the Lord had intimately known Peter. Now, you, 
you may remember that the Lord had said to Peter, Satan had des has desired thee that he might sift thee as wheat. That's he might desire all of you. It's in the plural. That he might sift you all as wheat. But I prayed for thee, so I'm going to ask you in your own mind, folks, is it possible for Jesus Christ to pray any prayer that would not be answered? And if your answer to that is not a violent no, then you haven't comprehended the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ in his humanity made one request, just one of any kind that was outside the will of God, he sinned. And if he sinned, if he sinned, everything that you call theology and everything that you call Christianity comes crumbling at your feet. Our entire redemption is based on a satisfactory price, a price that's paid by one who is innocent. So any prayer that the Lord prayed had to be answered. Simon, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and we want to automatically, we want to make that our faith. And personally, me as a human, I would have, I would have preferred that he, he prayed that I wouldn't be tempted. Uh, you know, that's what I prefer but that's not what he said. I have prayed for thee that thy faith not fail. Jesus tells Peter he's going to deny him at the end of John chapter 13. And with, with no chapter division, he then says, beginning at John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Dearly beloved, if you want a picture of grace in your mind, imagine the Lord Jesus Christ putting his arm around Peter's shoulder and saying, you're going to deny me violently three times with a curse but don't let your heart be troubled. I am astounded, and I want to be very, very careful when I say this, but I'm astounded at how much sin bothers many Christians. And folks, I am in no way trying to make light of sin. I believe sin is so terrible that Jesus Christ had to die that I might be forgiven, and though I may wish that that were not necessary, Though I may wish that he'd never had to die for me. Where is the peace and the rest and the joy that was purchased for us when Christ died in our place? Because I am told that in Hebrews chapter 10, we have no more conscience, guilt of sin. He removed it. In no way am I asking you to love sin. In no way am I telling you to sin. What I am telling you is that you have, or you should have, no conscious guilt of sin. Here is Peter, who just a few days before had violently denied Jesus Christ, who is saying in confidence, Lord, you know experientially, you know intimately, you know me so well, you know me so intimately, you know that I have affection for you. I know I denied you. I know I cursed. I know I forsook you. I know I was offended. I know I said I wouldn't be, and I was, but, but yet in all of that, you know that I love you. Peter, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Peter, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. How could his heart not be troubled when he went out and he wept bitterly? Oh, folks, I want you to grasp firmly the truth of God's word. You believe in God, believe also in me, he says. Have faith in God. I believe what that verse says is lay firm hold on the faithfulness of God. You are not redeemed because you are faithful. You're not redeemed because you don't deny. You're not redeemed because of the way you live. You are redeemed because of the faithfulness of God. Lay firm hold on the faithfulness of God. Peter would never, ever have known what it meant to have affection for the Lord Jesus Christ if there hadn't been that tremendous moment in his life when he denied his Lord. But more importantly, Peter never would have known how much the Lord loved him if it hadn't been for that moment. And when Peter says, Lord, you know, you know, experientially, you know, intimately, you went through that with me. And you know that I have affection for you. 
You prayed that my faith not fail. And your prayer could not go unanswered. It, it would be inconceivable if the reverse had happened. It would be, it'd be tantamount to saying that Jesus Christ was not God. You know intimately that I love you. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. And again, it's the word for pasture, shepherd. I think it goes from lambs to young sheep to mature sheep. In the first case, it's a matter of providing nourishment for them. In the second case, as they get up and, and, and they're, they move around and they're more active, it's, it's the activity of leading and, and directing, providing the correct pasture. Now, I, I don't want to make more out of that passage than ought to be made, but note that he doesn't say, evangelize my sheep. And I am in no way against evangelism. I believe the Lord has given some to be evangelists. And I believe the activity of the evangelist is to declare the word of God. Now, as many, many and many of ministers probably said, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. But, but there may be, there may be somebody within earshot, you know, out there who's never heard it before. And so we'll always simply declare the word of God to those who never heard it before. And, 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 the congregation may be full of those who have heard it before. And it seems to me that the Lord says here that the primary activity is the feeding and the shepherding of God's sheep. Because we're not going to feed and we're not going to shepherd any who are not God's sheep. The principal activity of the disciple is the care and the feeding of those for whom Christ died. The thing that scares me is I don't want to feed you. I want the Holy Spirit to do it. And all three of these verses say to Peter, feed those who are, are mine in one way or another. Feed or shepherd them. I would rather die than preach error. I'm glad that there are some of you out there who would stick pins in my, in my doll every, every once in a while. I'm not, I'm not here to build a big following. I'm not here... For any reason except I love the Lord and I love God's people. And I do not want to lead you into the wrong pasture. And my earnest prayer is and always has been that you'd search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. It is responsibility that I take very seriously. If you search the scriptures, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. This is Thank you for watching. This is Steve. I love you all truly. I truly, I love you all dearly. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.